So, uh, so I'm Athena Franzana. Thank you for introducing me, and thank you all for being here. Um, so that's the title of my talk. <laughs> but uh, first, a little bit about who I am and why I'm here. Um, so I'm a former scientist, and I have just completed my PhD on women's representation and experiences in the high-performance computing. And here I am celebrating the passing of my viva. Um, so I'm a tireless advocate of equality, diversity, and inclusion in STEM through my projects and the organizations I'm active um, member of. Uh, so here I am talking about my work on Wikipedia, and here I am pretending to be a robot for an outreach activity. Um, so last year I attended uh, the women's event of uh, EuroPython in Edinburgh. Uh, where I had some excellent discussions about women in computing and programming, and I believe this is the reason I'm here today. However, I have to admit that when I first got the invitation to be a keynote speaker, my first reaction was, uh, I'm not a programmer, uh, so why do you want me there? Um, when I started my research more than four years ago, the topic of gender in uh, STEM, in the, the gender imbalance in STEM, um, was not as hot as it is now. There has been a crazy uh, sudden focus on that topic and so many initiatives, projects and individuals appear to care about it and try to solve the issue. Most of the times by trying to increase the number of women in the workplace, panels or else, thinking and hoping that this is the solution of the problem. So I believe I was reasonably unsure and suspicious when I was called to be a keynote speaker at a progr programming conference uh, with, as far as I'm aware, a low number of women and as far as I can see in here. Um, after a chat I had with the chair of the program group, I understood that the EuroPython group actually care, and they want to discuss about gender, gender imbalance and raise awareness, so I'm particularly happy to be here and share my research findings with you today. So why gender imbalance is important and why we need to talk about it? Apart from the obvious reasons of uh, equal opportunities and a larger variety of options for all, Research has shown that gender balance teams demonstrate better performance and um, better collaborations among team members and higher productivity um, in comparison to male or female dominated teams. It has also been noted that gender diversity can take research to different routes, which might lead to new discoveries, improve the quality of products and cover all needs. For example, there is a project um, which addresses the limitation of understanding diseases, diseases and developing the most effective treatments due to gender bias in medical research. Finally, there has been a high demand in STEM jobs and is expected to grow even more in the future and reports show that it will be difficult to fill in these positions due to limited um, talent pool. So what has been done to achieve gender balance? The gender balance in STEM, as I said earlier, might be a currently hot topic but it's not new. Var various policies and strategies have been developed to tackle the identified barriers that girls and women meet while studying or pursuing a career in STEM. Providing data that show the low numbers of women in STEM-related subjects is key to raise awareness and motivate action for improvement. Outreach programs which encourage girls and expose them to STEM careers and female role models have been proved to have a positive effect on girls' and, on girls interest and engagement. Particularly, role models seem to help girls change their stereotypical views on STEM careers and to help women. Mentoring also seems to have a positive impact on women's confidence and progression. Equality, diversity and inclusion and unconscious bias training is one of the most popular strategies institutions and companies use to raise awareness and reduce biases. Um, however, even though some studies show that trainings, these trainings um, um, have a positive effect, a lot of reports indicate that such trainings have no or little impact or sometimes even negative impact. An important conclusion of those reports is that for such trainings to have a significant impact, um, positive impact on gender balance, they must be part of a wider program of actions. Finally, since maternity leave and caring responsibilities have been identified as obstacles for women to advance in their career, the shared parental leave policy has been introduced but its effect on gender equality has not been established yet. However, all those policies and strategies do seem to have a positive impact, but have they affected the number of women in STEM? The latest statistics 
so that there is a small increase of female students' enrollments in STEP subject in comparison to last year or the year before. But still, the numbers of female students are too small in comparison to male ones. For example, according to um, the higher education uh, statistics, 2,000 more female students enrolled in computer science in the year 2017-2018 um, in comparison to 2015-2016, but similarly, a lot more stu uh, male students added to the already very high number. This statistics is for the UK, by the way. <laughs> um, so all the information uh, aforementioned and my personal experiences and the fact that there, there was no previous study or report Sorry, I just lost my talk notes. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Thank you. I'm also not an experienced speaker. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, my personal experience and the fact that there was no previous study or report on the gender balance status of the HPC community, even though it's an inter interesting area that spans various STEM and non-STEM subjects, motivated the establishment of the Women in HPC Network and my research on this topic. Women in HPC is a network that brings women of the community together, promote and support them, and raise awareness on equality, diversity, and inclusion matters. Since anecdotally and traditionally, the majority of HPC users and technical experts have a STEM background, I hypothesized that there is a high chance for women to be underrepresented in the HPC community. However, that seeks further investigation. So I wanted to find out if the same or similar reasons and obstacles as for women in STEM keep women away from HPC or if there are specific problems within the community. For this, I firstly attempted um, to demonstrate evidence that women are underrepresented in HPC and then to identify reasons and ways of improvement. To obtain a first picture of the women in the HPC community, I decided to examine um, historical demographics of two different settings, which are potentially indicators um, of the participation and contribution of women in the community. I de Sorry, I have some issues with my notes. I gender analyzed na the names of more than 27,000 participants at major HPC related conferences, as well as more specialized conferences that concern HPC related topics. I examined the numbers of women that participated as keynote speakers, <coughs> paper and poster authors and presenters, workshop, workshop and tutorial organizers, and presenters and committee members and attendees. Also, since programming is considered traditionally as one of the basic skills that one needs to use the HPC facilities, I calculated the participation of women and men to training courses for HPC users and or developers provided by Archer UK's National Supercomputing Service. I collected and under, analyzed data from five years and vari various levels and courses. For example, level one includes introduction to HPC, level two scientific programming with Python, and level three advanced MPI. From the conference data analysis, I found that women were fewer than men in all categories of participation. On average, I found that there were 9% female paper authors, 0 to 1 female invited speakers for every 4 male, 7 to 12 female percent female poster authors, and 1 female workshop or tutorial, pre tutorial presenter for every 8 to 11 male. An important finding that seeks further uh, research is that in the cases where women in HPC or diversity committees were active, there was an increase of women. For example, at the supercomputing conference in USA, female invited speakers increased from 13% in 2013 to 46% in 2016. We believe that the appointment of a diversity committee by the supercomputing conference is the reason for this improvement. From a total of 67 and analyzed courses, I found that women were outnumbered three to one by men at all levels. From the analysis of the same data, I also found that women had Ha much higher attendance frequency at level one courses. Women were identified more as users than developers from their choice of courses, and their difficulty rating increased gradually with the course levels. Similarly with the conferences, I noticed that um, courses organized by women in HPC attracted more women. For example, at level one course organized by women in HPC in 2015, there were 24 female participants and only one male participant. Surveys can produce data for both quantitative and qualitative analysis. I decided to run a survey for the HPC community to discuss 
our so far findings and hypotheses and gather evidence that added to our quantitative results as well as to identify our areas for further investigation and improvement in the community. Some of the most important findings from the analysis of the survey data are that most men and women come from STEM background and they believe that there is an underrepresentation of women in HPC. Women are less likely than men to receive training, programming training, and develop their own software. And also women are more likely to be affected by parenthood, travel less to conferences, feel discriminated, uh, in being interested in having a mentor, and feel that they belong in a um, minority group. Finally, a very important finding is that there were clear differences in training and software development tendency between the STEM and the non-STEM groups. That means that people that have a STEM background receive more um, training and they develop more uh, their own software in comparison to people that come from non-STEM um, subjects. This is of great importance. Um, because it supports the hypothesis that people from non-STEM background do not receive enough or at all programming training, which might be one of the obstacles that keep these people um, from using HPC facilities for the research. And this can have an impact on the gender balance of the community, since non-STEM subjects tend to have better gender balance. Finally, for gaining an in-depth understanding of the experiences of the people of the HPC community, I conducted interviews and focus group discussions, hearing from a total of 48 people about their background and their relation to HPC, um, to HPC community, personal stories and views, helped me support and interpret my previous findings and stimulate new ideas or hypotheses for future work. Similarly, here the majority of interviewees come from a STEM subject, believe that there is an underrepresentation of women, and the reasons are similar to the reasons for women to be underrepresented in STEM subjects, with stereotypes and discrimination being top in the list. Additionally, some really important findings came of this research method. The lack of formal training and earlier exposure to HPC are major barriers for entering the HPC community, especially to people for um, especially for people coming from non-computational background. Here you can see some of the quotes from the interviewees. Um, indeed, most of the participants reported that they are self-taught in programming and that the training provided is not adequate. However, women, as soon as they start programming and using HPC, they prefer computational research rather than theory or lab-based. A lot of women complained about the lack of support and the unfriendly male-dominated technician environment, as well as the language being used being too technical for people not coming from comput computational background. But probably the most serious HPC-specific uh, problem is that the HPC community and its development seem to be focused more on the power and the size of the machines rather than the science they are used for and the user's needs. This image makes the community fairly unattractive to some and mostly to women. Also, it was, it was called as a closed club by many interviewees that is only open to specific people and projects from specific backgrounds. Other important findings from the qualitative method, including interviewees' positive view on mentoring and role models, their negative view on current equality, diversity, and inclusion training, and their suggestions for improving the community's gender balance, with main ones being programming to schools and all disciplines, outreach, promotion of female role models, change of perception of STEM and HPC as something hard and something that is not related to real life. So what are the main conclusions of this study and how can we use these findings? Are women in HPC actually underrepresented? Yes, they are underrepresented in the HPC community. The quantitative approach to my study revealed a clear underrepresentation of women at conferences and courses of the HPC community. Additionally, from the other methods, it was clear that the majority of the HPC community belongs to the STEM group, which supported our hypothesis that women must be underrepresented in the HPC community, since statistics show that they are underrepresented in, most of, the, in the, most of the STEM subjects. Consequently, the reasons of this underrepresentation are mostly similar to those that cause the low numbers of women in STEM. However, as we said earlier, HPC has its own obstacles for women, uh, with main ones, uh, the, um, the inadequate um, formal training, and the image of HPC. 
So where do we need to focus on to attract and retain more women in the HPC community, programming and commuting in generally? We know, we know what the problems are. We need to act in the right ways to solve the problem and hopefully improve the situation. We need to understand and make clear why gender balance and equality and diversity and inclusion are important and how to achieve them and not just rely on changing the numbers artificially and force it to happen. We need to break the stereotypes of STEM programming and computing by offering exposure to these subjects and to female role models as soon as possible, as early as possible, and create equal opportunities. As we mentioned earlier, a lot of initiatives, policies, and strategies exist, but if they don't act collaboratively, and if we don't measure the impact and evaluate them, they cannot have the desirable effects. Finally, there will always be obstacles. Men who don't think that there is an issue, women who like to be seen as special, people who take advantage of this imbalance. We should not let them stop the progress. We should fight them with evidence, produce reports and publish data, promote equality, diversity and inclusion, and evaluate your actions. Engage men and senior staff. Change the future. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the University of Edinburgh for funding uh, my research and uh, Women in HPC Network for initiating it. And also would like to thank um, the committee for inviting me here today and all of you who were interested enough to attend my talk so early in the morning. Thank you. I don't know what's happening. So guys, uh, if you have questions for Athena, this is the time to shine. Hi. People. <laughs> People. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Thank um, you. In the metrics that you show for um, the indicators for, for gender imbalance, sorry. Um, I, I missed one that I have seen in some conferences, uh, which is the um, ratio of people uh, participating in, in Q and A. Oh yeah, Q &A, I, yeah. Which I think is very interesting, also for highlighting the difference between the artificially uh, gender balance yes. and the, and the real gender balance. So many times in in conferences that are aware of the problem, they they balance the, the speakers, but at the end, the Q&A are like, yes, like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I, so I tried to, to see that as well, but I didn't have enough data for that because to actually gather data for this, I had to attend all the conferences and you know, like uh, write down the numbers. So I did, but it wasn't enough to prove something. But the ones, the ones I did, actually, there wasn't... Um, a significant difference from the questions women ask and men ask, but it's not enough to draw a conclusion, I'm afraid. So just a uh, point is, maybe this would, uh, this would be a nice uh, improvement in the, in the PyCon conferences, just to have someone in the organization taking note of the gender and making yes, statistics. Yes, sure, yes, that's what I meant by um, <coughs> publishing data and, you know, gather evidence, yeah, that's, I totally agree with you. Thank you. We have one Hi. more. Uh, Go ahead. To add this, actually, we, we are doing this, uh, especially for the speakers. So, uh, but we also for data protection, we not necessarily ask for a gender in, in the submission. So we uh, usually do statistics on uh, guessing on the first names and doing some research. Yeah. So we do care a lot. Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's how I did it. I, I guessed it from the first name, as you said, for, because of data protection, um, which makes my job harder. Um, so, of course, that has a little threat of validity there because, yes, I used an API to a platform with first names, but, of course, there is always a case of making a mistake. Okay. We have one more question at the end. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Hi. Um, you mentioned uh, by the end that there are those who would take advantage of the gender imbalance. Um, can you clarify a little bit? Because it 
doesn't seem to be any advantage at all in this yeah, gender I'm imbalance. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to clarify that. Um, so, from my experience, because I'm in this area of trying to solve the problem of equal diversity and inclusion, so I had. I have been involved with many projects. And what I have noticed is that even though there are a lot of, there's a lot of funding right now um, that is being given to, to projects that try to solve this problem, the problem seems not to be solved. Uh, so uh, it's not very nice to say that, but I'm, I'm afraid that there are people that just want to, this to, per, to be perpetuated just because to, they receive funding. It's very uh, hard to say that and not very nice, but it happens, unfortunately. Uh, so some people take advantage of that and also some people um, try to promote themselves by pretending uh, that they are advocates of equal diversity inclusion and actually just do it to put it in their CV. It happens, I'm afraid. I hope that covered. We have one more question. And by the way, if you have questions, please come forward to the microphones. Sorry, I can't see you. I can't yeah, see Yeah, there's one question here in front. Oh, oh here, oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Uh, I was just wondering if you have like a concrete tip uh, that Europython could implement next year to help the diversity. Yeah, so from, uh, apart from what we said already that uh, gather data, uh, gender data, um, it would be good to have, I don't know if this, year's, um, if this year you have a women event, event here, like the one I attended last year in Edinburgh, I think you don't. So that was really nice, so that would be nice to, to have an event where all women can gather, but also I wrote uh, an article about that last year and I asked men as well to attend it because it's really important to have men as well at this event so they can see uh, you know, mingle with women of the community and in a nice way uh, and see what their problems are and what, what they can do to help them. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Valeria? Yeah. Hi. Hi. So first of all, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yes, we just, uh, we don't have uh, uh, this Anything. year, this, uh, this event where yeah. that I also attended uh, last year, but I'm glad that we decided to have uh, a plenary talk so that everyone uh, could okay. uh, actually attend uh, and uh, I mean, listen to this topic. Yeah. But my question is, uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, training for unconscious bias, uh, and I was wondering if you have any tips on uh, how to actually handle this, uh, because uh, this is uh, often, I find also in, in my field, uh, in, in physics, one of the most uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> atrocious uh, so you, <laughs> problems uh, that we so encounter. Yeah, so you have attended an unconscious bias training? No, I, well, I mean, I have listened, yes, to talk, I've studied on my own, but uh, mm -hmm. I would like to understand if, there's, uh, if you have tips yeah. on how to give training on yeah. unconscious bias. Um, so, uh, from my experience, the, the majority of the people I talked with from the HPC community, they, as I mentioned in my talk, they had a negative opinion on those trainings, equality, diversity, and inclusion, and unconscious bias, because at the moment, um, for example, the University of Edinburgh uh, offers an, an online training, which is like literally ticking the box of, yeah, we did that, okay. You don't learn anything, you don't understand the problems, you don't understand what to do to, to solve the problem. So I think definitely no <laughs> to online uh, training. Um, so the best is to have uh, like proper tra training in a class with people that they are um, experts on equality, diversity, inclusion, and, and conscious bias. And the other thing that I found from um, talking with people from HPC community, it's that they would like to have like tailored um, uh, trainings that concern the community's problems and not generic equality, diversity, inclusion, and conscious bias training. That you know they have to include the problems of the community, like the ones I mentioned, and how to to deal with those. Um, and not just general, yes, we are all equal, that's all. <laughs> okay, I hope that helped. <laughs> we have one more question at the end over there. Hello. Hi, thank you for your excellent talking and thank for you. raising the question. Thank it's you. It's kind of funny that see that uh, some of our social concerns start clashing with uh, each other. 
like you need data about gender to your research, but some people consider that uh, disclosing gender is maybe some kind of discrimination. Mm -hmm. And uh, people also find against uh, binary gender, they define, uh, are, at the moment are accepted five genders or just do not sure, disclose yeah. them. Well, <laughs> just, uh, um, uh, I think it's good that our concerns are, are becoming so much that start clashing with, uh, with each other. However, my question. It's true that there's a gender imbalance across the society, particularly in technical jobs, particularly in IT. Uh, there is some very nice initiatives like Django Girls, Pi Ladies, that try to find that. Do you think that gender imbalance in HPC is worse than in IT in general? Do you think that fixing, contributing to gender balance in IT will automatically fix a gender imbalance in HPC or uh, it will become some sort of different field? Thank okay. you. Um, yeah, so as I said earlier, so HPC is a niche in computing. Um, so of course it has the same problems that any other commuting area. But uh, through my research I found that it has two specific problems as well. That it's a very closed um, club, as my interviewees uh, said it, and it only um, accepts people that they have already a background or um, a, a computational um, background and people that actually would like to do uh, computational research but don't have the background, for them is really difficult to get in the HPC community. Um, so the training is really important to offer more training um, for programming training in general and uh, how to use HPC facilities specifically. And then also change this image of HPC that something really out of the world and uh, just try to promote the uses, the applications of HPC. So I think HPC has to deal with those two as well, as well as everything else. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. So we need an HPC girl, like general girl. Yeah, yeah, so that's why we have women in HPC network. That's what they try to do, okay. We Thank have you. one more question over here in yeah, front. Hi. Thank you for your talk, it was amazing. Um, I'm yeah. not an HPC, I'm just a developer. Uh, but I've, all, I've also noticed that there are many women in this field and of course I personally would like to help with that and I've noticed several movements in training uh, young women and there are also a lot of uh, conferences and talks for us, but I was wondering whether you think that these gatherings help bringing more women into the field, or is just something that for us to pat ourselves on the back saying, yay, good for us? <laughs> yeah, I, I understand your question, yeah. So yeah, as I said, um, every action and every policy and strategy cannot solve the problem by itself. It needs to be a collaborative um, work. We have to do all together constantly to have an actual impact. So the women events are really good, as you said, for women to gather and talk with each other and help each other. But as I said earlier, I would like to see more men as well at women events because at the moment there are some women conferences and there are no men's, men at all there. And that really doesn't help the situation because, sorry to say that, but m mainly men are the problem in this case. Um, sorry. <laughs> so I'm being too honest. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I think they're good. We need to keep those, but we need a lot more to happen at the same time so we can see uh, an actual change, improvement. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one more question over there. Okay. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, I caught the tail end of it, really. Just to say that one point, I'm involved in um, teaching um, of the younger people, and I find that there is very little difference or no difference between girls and boys in the level of interest and enthusiasm and competence in these matters at a 
young age. So I'm wondering at what age do these differences begin to manifest? And also, have there been studies which have been undertaken at, in different regions of the world? And, you know, is there any region of the world which is more ahead than others with respect to these matters? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, as I said earlier, from my research, I found that women that had no programming background, when they actually started using programming, they preferred programming. They preferred computational uh, research than lab or theory-based one. So that showed to me that women actually like computing and programming. So this stereotype that women are not interested in computing, I don't think ex it exists. Um, so about the age now, I um, don't know if I'm the right person to answer that, um, so I, I have done some research on that, but um, I think, I think it, it really depends on the teachers and the parents and the stereotypes that uh, children receive from society, uh, so that applies as well uh, to the, um, the area that you mentioned, so it depends on how you grow up and what you receive from, from the society you grow up. So it's a, it's a little bit of a hard question. And I don't think that it has been, this question has been answered yet from research. Sorry, I didn't help very much. <laughs> we have one question here. Hi, and thank you for your great talk. Thank you. I think um, many people are not aware enough of this issue. And uh, my question would be, is there any advice that you would give to male uh, developers or STEM community in order to improve the situation? Mm -hmm. um, so apart from um, being nice, <laughs> being nice to women and particularly women um, and people in general, because again from my research I found that it's not only women that have the issue. I mentioned earlier about the people that come from non-STEM backgrounds and that includes men as well, that don't have computational background. So if we make the computing world a little bit friendlier to people that are not computing nerds, <laughs> and we change a little bit the language we use and um, help them to be part of this world because I think computing is now everywhere and it's good for everyone to, to know how to use it and how to program. Um, but apart from that, again, as I said earlier, it's good to listen to women, to attend women's events and try to understand the problem and mostly understand why do we need gender balance and how would that help them as well? How would that help productivity and the projects to become better? and world to become better. So yeah, I think trying to understand and not be like, okay, not this again. I don't wanna talk about this again and it's fine and women are not interested because that's not the case. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. We have one more question. Thank you very much for the keynote. Uh, it's a really good talk. Uh, it also, one thing that you mentioned really um, make me think, like you said that we should invite men to attend uh, women events, because uh, I'm also like a meetup organizer back in London, and then um, also I organize um, events for, uh, spe like specifically is for um, gender minorities in tech society, like mainly women who attend. Um, there's always um, debate among like, uh, other organizers whether we should allow men into these events because um, I have heard different feedbacks about um, these like for example uh, male participant they would be like oh we don't feel that comfortable <laughs> or, like it's, it's, a, it's a very I think it's like opening a door to a, a, a different situation because we are used to like tech events being mainly dominated by men and then it kind of um, make me think that what the line we should draw in this kind of way because because um, sometimes I also know that women prefer an event to be purely just like women to attend so they feel safe, they feel that they won't have um, some kind of, um, they say like male toxicness in the room or something. So um, yeah, so I, it really makes me think like where we should draw this line to, um, to make an event that's like, it's nice for everybody and but also empower 
empowering women to feel that they are not like a minority and weaker gender in the tech society. Yeah. So what do you think? <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's, that's, uh, that's really a good question. And um, I had this exact discussion last year when I wrote that article and I said that um, there were, actually there were a couple of men there and you were there. <laughs> there were a couple of men at the women's event and uh, I had very good discussions. I, I was mostly talking to men. So it was really nice because I understood what they think about it and obviously for them to be there, they seem to be interested in the topic. Um, so I found it good, but then I had people sent, commenting on my article and saying like, oh, we don't want to come to this uh, women's event because uh, we want women to feel comfortable, as you said, like, oh, yeah, so they can talk about their stuff. But their stuff is your stuff as well. I mean, it's, it's for everyone. Um, so I, my opinion is that all events should be open to everyone. Um, now, watch the language. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, if you're nice, so you don't have to go there as a crazy feminist and say, yeah, you toxic men, we don't want you here because we want them. We want them here. We want them to, to come and listen and we find a solution all together. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more question over there. Okay. Can, sorry, uh, I don't have a question, but I wanted to give a suggested reading for anybody who is interested in the topic. Uh, so there's the, this website called the heterodoxacademy.org and they have uh, amazing literature review uh, that, that review uh, all the topics that relate to uh, uh, gender differences uh, yeah. and uh, uh, increased male variability uh, hypothesis and all these elements that tend to be ignored in these discussions. So a very good reading. And okay, can you there. say it again? Uh, heterodoxacademy.org. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you. And one question over here. So, um, no, I just, I just wanted to say that uh, regarding like uh, the events, uh, I think it's very nice to have it uh, open to, to everyone, as you were saying. And if you, as a man, feel uh, uncomfortable in being in an environment where there are many women, well, <laughs> welcome, because <laughs> that's yes, actually okay. the first uh, step to understand uh, also exactly. uh, how women feel uh, in most situations uh, in which they are at most uh, any conference, uh, because it's actually proven there's data, uh, as uh, uh, say someone was asking, uh, at least uh, for, the, for, uh, for Europe, mm -hmm. um, on, uh, again, um, say how uh, this is distributed according to topics, uh, according to how the level of the hierarchy uh, increases. Yes. Uh, so it's actually quite balanced already at the level of PhD, usually in all disciplines, and then it gets worse and worse yeah. with leadership. So yeah, that's also that's the underrepresentation uh, that, uh, again, uh, gets worse uh, with yeah. responsibilities. Um, so again, yeah, I think it's really true. good. And uh, as, a, as a, again, another uh, tip that was uh, mentioned, which I found, I think, in uh, well, many situations, it's not nice uh, for, uh, say, women to intervene all the time when something happens uh, which is uh, not correct. So if uh, you are a man, as a tip, and you assist to a situation which is uh, unfair or which, again, uh, it, uh, you notice that shouldn't happen, uh, I think, uh, or I, I mean, read, and I would like to hear your opinion on that, uh, that uh, what you could do as a man is uh, to intervene, but to intervene not to defend or protect the woman, but uh, to address the person who is behaving incorrectly and demonstrate and show and explain to that person why that is incorrect. So it's not about uh, defending the woman, but it's to intervene yeah. in place also of the women on uh, the data, on what's happening, and uh, on why that situation should not just take place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I totally agree. And that's what we need to learn at those equality, diversity, and inclusion trainings, these this kind of um, situations, like examples and case studies of what, how we can act and react when something like this happens. Thank you for this. Thank you. One more question. Um, you mentioned mentoring earlier, and I've um, heard of many programs where they were specifically looking for women to mentor um, girls or young mm -hmm. women. 
Um, do you know anything of the impact of mentoring programs um, depending on the mentors being male or female? Is it better to have a female mentor for girls or young women or um, is it good to have a male mentor as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, from my experience and through my research, I found that women prefer to have women mentors because obviously they can understand better their problems. Now, if they can help them with the problems, I don't know. Um, but usually that's the case. So my opinion is, it, it, it would be good to have men, mentor, male mentors as well, especially senior, um, senior staff mem male members because um, it is good to bring them together with young female to, to show them, to guide them better, I think, so how to get to a leadership position because usually men are, have more leadership positions. Um, but I'm not sure if, I don't think there is any study yet that shows that that's better or worse. I'm not sure about that. Um, so I, have, I had a woman mentor and she helped me a lot. So my experience is not helpful. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but uh, also about mentoring is really important to understand the, the difference between formal and informal mentoring because sometimes we confuse formal mentoring, as you said, you mentioned that there is a specific program that um, run from the company or the institution you work, and usually people do that again as they do the equal and diversity inclusion trainings, like ticking the box and not really caring. So I, I, from my experience, again, I think that informal training, that finding someone that you think that, that someone can help you, it, it doesn't matter if it's men or man or woman, um, that probably is more helpful than the formal program, mentoring programs. Thank you. Do we have more questions for our speaker today? Well, if we don't have any further questions, let's have a very, very warm applause for Athena. Thank you.